Right, Timothy, thanks a lot for that. Let's now take a deep dive into the issue. We are joined by T.S. Krishnamurthy, former Chief Election Commissioner, Shadan Farasat, Supreme Court advocate and CPIM's lawyer in the electoral bonds case is also with us. And finally, Anjali Bharatwaj, right to information activist, is joining us as well. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, Mr. Krishnamurthy, let me come to you first and let's begin with the trigger that we saw today. The petitioners red flagging how we have information in two sets in two data sets and that without any matching and without any linkage, without establishing which donor sent how much money to which political party, calling this data meaningless and the apex court also taking a note of that. Well, uh, I have always been saying that the, the electoral bond scheme did not uh, base itself on full transparency and uh, the earlier system was also not very desirable and I have always taken the stand that we need a new scheme wherein the nexus between the corporates and the political parties need to be need to be snapped. That can be done only by having a national election fund. So I have uh, I strongly uh, favor a system where corporates are not directly giving to your political parties. And as far as the individual right. companies, I don't wish to comment about it. I do not know the, the recipient or the donor. But the issue is, the general principle is corporates and political parties should not be in an obnoxious relationship. Right. Uh, Mr. Krishnamurti, in your experience, also the Election Commission has been organizing elections for decades now. How would you describe this moment for the Election Commission? What needs to change? What makes... Can you repeat? How would you describe this as a moment for election commission in its working? And how does the body, the election commission as a body, need to change as a result of this judgment of the Supreme Court on the electoral bonds data and scrapping the electoral bond scheme? So the funding of the funding of the political parties for electoral purposes has always been a biggest challenge to the election commission. Neither the old system nor the amended system was favoring full transparency. So it has always been difficult for us to prove on many occasions the, the expenditure incurred by the candidates as well as the expenditure incurred by the parties. Sometimes they are done in cash, sometimes they are done by to prove uh, friends and so on, relatives. So it's very difficult. The present system or the old system has not, it has not been very uh, congenial for free and fair elections. Not only that, it has always been a big challenge for an ordinary man to contest elections because even the feelings and the expenditure fixed for the candidate has never been followed. But it is very difficult to prove the actual expenditure because of various considerations, because of cash payment and so on. So I have therefore suggested both the system need to be scrapped and there should be a, a national election fund. The money the donors could be given 100% tax exemption and that fund should be used for public funding of the elections. And the guidelines for spending this amount or giving it to the candidate will be in consultation with all political parties or all the recognized political parties. Uh, Mr. Krishnamurthy, I'll just come in. You've mentioned that your solution that you've proposed is to have uh, a national election fund where the companies can make their contributions and subsequently claim tax exemptions. Uh, the question I want to ask is, and this was a concern expressed by the Apex Court as well, should there be some form of safeguards or restrictions in terms of companies uh, and especially loss-making companies? Uh, the Supreme Court very clearly recording in its judgment that any time a loss-making company is to start making donations, which we've seen uh, by virtue of the data that the SBI revealed, any time that happens, it is done to secure a specific benefit. A quid pro quo angle been is what the Apex Court hinted at. I have been Secretary of the Department of Company Affairs. I will never advocate a loss-making company to be enabled to give any donation, particularly without the consent of the shareholders. Right. That is an important point, sir. Uh, let me also ask, what kind of onus does this put on the government now, on the government of the day, we're going to see Lok Sabha elections now. Uh, once, once the new government is sworn in, what do you think the opposition and the government needs to do together on this? And do you think it will be eventually the Supreme Court which will have to show a direction? 
I'm afraid the law does not give any power to the election commission to, to uh, implement any new scheme. It has to go by the law of the land. And unless and until a new law is framed, we have to carry on with the old law. And it is not a very happy state of affairs because even the old law had its own infirmities. And the cash transactions of the new, uh, in, uh, for in, uh, enormous amount was being given in small bits and pieces by various people. For example, in Canada, the political parties are not expected to get any, to get any donation from the public. Only the members of the party can give. Why can't we prevent anybody giving any donation to political parties? After all, the, the fund that is required for election funding can be done by public spending without the political parties being directly involved and be under an obligation to oblige the donors. Okay, uh, Mr. Krishnamurti, thank you so much for joining us on the program. Uh, let's uh, move on to our other guests, Anjali Bhardwaj also joining us. Uh, Ms. Bhardwaj, you have been going through this extensive data, this exhaustive data on electoral bonds. Uh, almost uh, 22,217 bonds were purchased over a five-year period. Now, many of these companies had investigations going on against them by the ED, by the IT department. Uh, there cannot be an, any kind of correlation or a direct correlation that we can say between the raids on them and the funding that has gone or the bonds that have been purchased by the parties. But what are some of the key questions that come to your mind after an analysis of this data? Well, uh, let me just start by saying that uh, one thing that we have been consistently uh, saying about the electoral bonds, and it's one of the biggest criticisms that people have made about the bonds, is that they're completely anonymous. They have opened the floodgates of unlimited funding to political parties in an anonymous manner. And this has really harmed people's right to know, right to know what political parties, where they are funded from. And of course, because of the quid pro quo uh, nature of those donations, which the Supreme Court also talked about, it basically means that as voters, we have had no information when we go to vote uh, that, you know, who is the political party getting funds from and therefore who they're going to be working for. So I think that there has been this huge concern and that's really what has driven uh, the whole campaign against these anonymous electoral bonds publicly. Now, when the Supreme Court uh, pronounced its judgment and there was also a lot of discussion about the donors and the redeemers not being matched. Uh, we had always thought that even just having this information in two silos will be very, very powerful. Because what it is showing to us is the list of those companies, those individuals who have donated bonds. And I think that the exercise that has happened over the last, you know, less than 24 hours is really showing how much this data can reveal about uh, the political system in our country. We, have see we are seeing that, uh, like the Supreme Court noted, there seems to be a clear right. case of um, potential quid pro quo with many companies, where we are seeing right. that there are large contracts being given out me... around the time right, that they... Right, Ms. Bhardwaj, you've given us a couple of points. Let's build on that, uh, that the Apex Court is finding it difficult to go through to the SBI and to get all the details, full disclosure. We'll, that, of course, is for a, uh, as a later point in time. We'll come back to that. But before we proceed, you mentioned quid pro quo. That's a concern that the Apex Court has expressed. Uh, Mr. Farasat, let me come to you. Uh, now, again, just to reiterate the point that Parikshit made. Uh, that at no point is there any indication or evidence of quid pro quo from the data that was released. So let's uh, be clear on that. No evidence at this point. But nonetheless, there is an increasing trend of companies that are emerging, which seem to have bought these bonds in and around a time, in the proximity of the time that they faced an EDCBI or an IT raid. Mr. Krishnamurti gave us some valuable feedback. No loss-making company should be allowed to make these donations. Should a company facing an EDCBI probe also face a restriction that no company or its related entity should be allowed to make uh, such donations, a clear case of conflict of interest, perhaps? 
Uh, the short uh, answer to your question is yes, but obviously an anonymous scheme, you couldn't have prevented it. That was the whole purpose. That's why we were all against the anonymous scheme because it allows you to do a whole bunch of things which could be potentially illegal without anybody coming to know of it. And now that the data is out in the public domain, those things are coming out. I think the first thing I want to flag is we have been less than 24 hours since this data has come. Uh, so it's really early days as far as analyzing the data is concerned. I think three or four patterns will slowly emerge across the board. And one is, of course, the obvious one, which the Supreme Court has talked about. We argued it before the court. The court also accepted that, which was quid pro quos. So if amounts have gone and then contracts have been given within a short span thereafter, obviously, that's a pub, I mean, that's uh, something that has to be then investigated. That's number one. Second, when what you're talking about, this ED funding, right? Uh, sorry, this uh, investigating agencies uh, uh, being involved and then funds being given. And I think there was some newspapers also which reported this today. I mean, this also will obviously need to be investigated. But really speaking, and, and some of the judgments of the Supreme Court also noted, some of the counsel submitted, that there was a potential that uh, monies could be asked from companies as protection money. You know, I'm using that term protection money. So basically, we will, the ruling party will protect you from governmental agencies if you give money. So I get a rate done, then after that money's come and then the rate goes slow. So this is early days, you are right. I mean, right now we don't have a clear cut evidence, but as timelines keep on coming out and as investigative journalists uh, like yourselves and others in the news media investigate it, I think it will become very clear that a whole bunch of illegalities, some of this we could have contemplated and some of it which we could not have contemplated will come out. Finally, I think it's also important right. to say in the same way that it is possible that some companies would have, I don't think we should uh, you know, tar everybody with the same brush. It is possible that some corporations would have just donated without any quid pro quo or without any illegality. So I think it's important that all of the data comes out with the electoral bond number. And therefore, the corporations which have not done anything wrong should also be clean. And the ones which have indulged right. in some... Shadan. Yes. I have to take a short commercial break. I'm going to come back to you because you're making a very important point. And it's exactly for this reason the Supreme Court intervened and said that please comply with the order uh, with the fullest possible details because we need to know the unique numbers. We need to know who these donations are exactly going to, who are they really meant for. We're going to take a short break at this point. When we return, we'll continue this conversation with Shadan Farasat, Anjali Bharadwaj, and we'll also tell you who are the top parties which have redeemed these electoral bonds. Don't go anywhere. We've got a lot of analysis coming up.
Welcome back. You are watching a special broadcast on the News Centre on electoral bonds. The Supreme Court has pulled up the State Bank of India for not disclosing the unique serial numbers linked to electoral bonds, thereby not entirely complying with the top court's previous orders. Ashmit Kumar is joining us, our legal editor. Ashmit, you have been covering this case in the Supreme Court. That is where this ball started rolling. Give us a sense of the observations of the court today and why are they significant in the electoral bonds episode. So 24 hours after uh, the uh, revelation of the data, we know who donated, we know which parties got how much, we don't know which donor donated how much to which party. Now, on the evening of March 14th, the Election Commission, as per the Supreme Court directions, published the electoral bond data supplied by the State Bank of India with one key ingredient missing. The data supplied was in two parts. Which party secured how much and which donors donated how much? But it had a missing link. SPI has not shared the unique serial numbers of individual bonds. Now, why is this serial number important? To answer that, we have to travel back in time to 2018. SPI at the time had written to the finance ministry asking for each bond to be given a unique alphanumeric number. The SPI had said that this will establish an audit trail. The bank also said that in case of law enforcement agencies seeking such information, such a serial number will help to source the information. Now, interestingly, finance ministry at that point had agreed towards assigning such a unique serial number to each bond. That is what has been cited by the petitioners before the Supreme Court. They argued that uh, having two separate lists of donors and parties is meaningless without knowing who donated to which party. Now, they claim that the serial number will help answer these questions. One, who bought the bonds? Number two, how much was being donated? And number three, which party received it? This rationale was echoed by the Supreme Court as well. The Chief Justice of India flagged how SBI had failed to share the serial numbers. The CGI observed that the court had asked the SBI to share all details, full disclosure. Let's also keep in mind that in the previous order of March 11th, the Supreme Court had warned the SBI against non-compliance. The Supreme Court order read in I quote, We will be inclined to proceed against it, SBI, for willful disobedience of the judgment if SBI does not comply with the directions of this court. The Supreme Court has now issued a notice to the SPI. The bank must respond on why it did not reveal the serial number of each bond. SPI will have time only till the weekend to respond. The Supreme Court will resume hearing in this case on Monday. Meanwhile, the Supreme Court has also directed the Election Commission to publish data from political parties on contributions from individual donors. This information is expected to be published on Sunday. Both the SPI and the Election Commission clearly have a busy weekend ahead, Parishad. Absolutely. Uh, we will be seeing more details. And clearly, as we were talking earlier, Ashmit, this is not the end of the road as far as the electoral bonds case in the Supreme Court goes. There will be more details coming out in the days to come. Uh, and tomorrow, we have the Election Commission press conference where they will announce the dates for the Lok Sabha elections. The model code of conduct will come into effect and possibly the Election Commission will react to developments in the Apex Court as well. Let's... Uh, Continue with our guest, Adan Farasat, Supreme Court advocate, and Anjali Bhardwaj, right to information activist, continue to be with us. Anjali Bhardwaj, coming back to you, tomorrow, if SBI also gives up the recipient details, gives us the unique number, or gives us names of the political parties which have directly benefited from these donors, then how will this information actually help the citizen? Because... Before raising any questions against the company, entity, individual, uh, we must think that every individual or company can go and say, how can you link this to a particular contract that we got or a particular case against us? Giving a donation to a particular party was our choice. That's right. So let me just say what will come out if the SBI actually gives the unique bond numbers, uh, both for the purchasers and for the redeemers. What we will then be able to do is that we will be able to match who gave which bond worth how much money to which political party. So today, while we have data on who are the donors or rather the purchasers of the electoral bonds and who all redeemed, which political parties redeemed electoral bonds worth how much on which date. We do not have the names of the uh, donors or the purchasers and 
who those bonds went to, uh, to the political parties to whom those bonds were donated. But you are absolutely right that uh, each of these uh, potential allegations that money was given for a quid pro quo, that uh, you know somebody uh, wanted a contract and therefore gave this as a uh, donation to be able to get uh, a favorable uh, you know contract or uh, this was used as extortion money as we are seeing that in many cases there were uh, allegations and therefore investigation by agencies there were raids uh, on people on companies who then donated money through electoral bonds all of these are subjects of investigation i think uh, for a robust democracy it is very important that citizens have the right to know who is funding which political party when they go to vote, cast their votes, because without that, they will not know who the party is likely to be influenced by. But beyond that, to when we cast, you know, before we cast any aspersions, it's important that there be a full investigation, and only then can one arrive at right. any kind of uh, a conclusion. Right. Uh, Mr. Farasat, let me come to you now and let me just draw your attention to the Election Commission in this case. Uh, the Election Commission, by its own admission, has given the data in a sealed cover to the Supreme Court. This data, what is this data? Well, as per the previous Supreme Court directions, it's quite clear the Election Commission was required to source information from political parties based on individual contributions that they received. This data, as per today's directions, the EC is expected to publish that on Sunday. Will this perhaps be the missing link that will draw uh, a, a direct match between the donor and the political party? No. So, there are two different things. I think, see, there is data between uh, the beginning of the scheme, that is February 2018, right till April, April 2019, when that interim order of the Supreme Court was passed. And that data relates to what the political parties received, correct? Now, that data will be published in the next two or three days as per the Supreme Court direction today. That data is what the political parties have with themselves. It may or may not reveal the identity of the persons who have donated to them. Yeah, my uh, my uh, in intuitive sense is that some of those uh, letters and data will, some of those won't. So really speaking, even for this period, that is for February 2018 till April 2019, I think the Supreme Court will eventually need to pass an order of the same kind which it has passed from April 2019 right up till uh, 2024, which is that uh, SBI itself should release the data along with that alphanumeric number. That is the only way you can actually do the full matching uh, of which electoral bond which went to which political party as if it was in cash. And that's really the alphanumeric number is the key on both the redeeming side as also uh, on the side of its issuance. And that will be the determinant factor. Otherwise, I don't think the data uh, will be able to be matched fully. That's so the SBI here holds the key. The CGI there, finding it difficult to get through. First, there was an application for extension by SBI. Uh, then, no disclosure of these serial numbers. And now, a notice has been issued to the State Bank. I'd like to thank all of our panelists, uh, Mr. Krishnamurti, Mr. Farasat, as well as Ms. Bharatwaj, uh, for joining us and for throwing more light. Clearly, Monday will be a key day when the SPI will have to respond uh, with either the number or an explanation as to why no number. Uh, the CGI, of course, will be hearing this case once again, the CGI-led bench, and that will uh, give us more clarity on the way forward. With that, uh, we're heading into a short break, but don't go anywhere. On our electoral bonds case, we'll come back with much more analysis on the other side.
Hello and welcome to a special broadcast on the electoral bonds case. I'm Ashmit Kumar and with me is Parikshit Luthra. Now, the Election Commission published the electoral bond data furnished by the State Bank of India late last night. The data shows that bonds worth 12,156 crores were purchased under the scheme between April of 2019 and January of 2024. The big takeaway, the top five donors account for 28% of all electoral bonds purchased. The number one donor is a lesser-known entity, Coimbatore-based uh, Future Gaming and Services. This company purchased electoral bonds worth 1,368 crores. Hyderabad-based infrastructure firm Megha Engineering and Infrastructure, which purchased bonds worth nearly 1,000 crore rupees, comes a close second. Large corporates like Anil Agarwal led Vedanta, Sunil Bharti Mittal's Bharti Airtel and uh, Birla Group promoted SL Mining are also among the top contributors. But those are the corporates. How does the encashment look like, Parikshit? Give us a sense. Well, one thing that really comes across when we study the data is that election spending has significantly gone up since the last Lok Sabha election. And we've definitely seen that uh, when we see the bond redemption numbers for October, November 2023, when the five state elections were taking place, and a lot of political parties have uh, withdrawn funds in the month of January and February as well. Now, let's get you some analysis. Uh, 22,217 bonds were purchased and approximately 22,000 have been redeemed. Close to 50% of the 12,769 crores of bonds have been redeemed by the BJP. The BJP, in fact, redeemed bonds worth 6,061 crores between April 2019 and January 2024. So we're looking at a almost a five-year period. And between April and May 2019, 1,700 crores were uh, redeemed. That, so this was before and just during the Lok Sabha elections. And this year, in January 2024, they have taken out 202 crore so far. This is what we know at the moment as per the data. If you look at uh, the Trinamool Congress, the Trinamool Congress is the second party in terms of redemption of bonds. They have redeemed bonds worth 1,610 crore rupees between April 2019 and January 2024. Even for this party, the uh, redemption of bonds spiked during the five-state assembly election last year. Then look at uh, the Congress party. They have redeemed bond worth 1,421 crores in the last five years, in October 2023, that is just one month ahead of the uh, five-state election, they withdrew 400 crores and 35 crores has been uh, redeemed in January 2024. Uh, the Congress, uh, as we have pointed out, is number three on that list. The Bharatiya Rashtra Samiti, which was TRS earlier, they have redeemed bonds worth 1,215 crores. The Biju Janta Dal, the ruling party in Odisha, they have redeemed bonds worth 776 crore rupees. Right, Pariksha, thanks a lot for that. Let's take it forward now. Akshay Rauth, former Director General of the Election Commission, joins us. We're also joined uh, by Major General Anil Varma, Head of Association for Democratic Reforms and the lead petitioner in the electoral bonds case and Sanjay Ghosh, uh, Senior Advocate. Gentlemen, thank you so much for joining us, for being a part of this. Uh, Major General, let me come to you, the lead petitioner in this case. Uh, you had expressed some fears on the date of the judgment that these are in the nature of bearer bonds. Uh, have those fears been vanquished by way of the data that emerged? A lot of key details emerging in terms of companies that contributed, how much they were contributing, and also interesting data points on in and around whether this uh, contribution was located in and around any CBI ED rates. Any clarity on the way forward? See, uh, yeah, we definitely welcome the uh, transparency uh, and the right to know of the people as per the judgment which has uh, emerged. But the fact is that it is not still fully 100% uh, transparent <clears throat> because the linking is still not possible between the donors and the <clears throat> Political party which got those uh, electoral bonds. So uh, now people are working at it. Uh, there are a lot of researchers and investigative journalists and etc. who will maybe come out with a lot of interesting facts. And some have already come out. Like there are some loss making companies which have been donating, and uh, uh, there were some contracts awarded to some other companies. And a lot of these uh, companies have been raided by the CDI and the ED and all that. 
uh, whether it was before the payment of the uh, uh, donation via the electoral bond or after that. So all these things will be investigated and things will come out. But as uh, some people are saying that now uh, today the Supreme Court has directed the SPI to give the unique uh, uh, numbers uh, to uh, be disclosed and they have directed the SPI. Even after that comes out, as per Mr. Garg, I was just there with on another uh, channel with him. He says even then people will not be able to join the dots. So let's see how it plays out. But I just want to correct the figures which you uh, uh, just gave out, uh, which Mr. Parikshit gave out. Uh, firstly, in these data which has been released as of now, uh, it is from the 9th to the 30th phase and total of 20,421 electoral bonds have been purchased worth rupees 12,769 crores. Okay. And in the top 10 donors, uh, it is 4,770 electoral bonds worth rupees 4,551.57 crores, which is 37.44% of the entire amount of donations. Out of this, the mm -hmm. corporates have donated 96.80%. That is amount worth rupees mm -hmm. 11,776. And individuals mm -hmm. have donated rupees 389 crores only, which is 3.2% of the uh, total donations. All right. Thank you for pointing that out. And uh, we must... Uh also praise uh, the Association of Democratic Reform so extensively studying the data and putting it out on their website for citizens to view. Uh, Mr. Akshay Raut, if I can come back to you, uh, we have also seen a lot of increase in election spending and this is what uh, ADR's data also shows, especially in the run-up to the five-state assembly elections uh, last year. Uh, what does this data, the first look at it and the trends uh, mean to you and what is the big picture that you see in terms of election spending going up over the years? Well, I think uh, election spending is a reality. Like uh, if uh, the prices are rising and the elections are becoming more combative and to lose an election is, uh, is not a political party or a candidate's objective. It's their objective to win the election. And many times, not only in matters of money, in matters of conduct also, they tend to violate. And they tend to do excesses. That's, uh, that's the reality on the ground. But we have regulators. We have enforcers. We have people who should uh, uh, call the right shots. And I think one of the exercises which we are just talking about and your subject of the day is uh, the Supreme Court direction that we should have transparency disclosure on uh, which company is donating how much and who are the parties taken how much. But as uh, General Burma was very rightly saying, uh, the thread is not complete till we have full disclosures and matchings done. So that will be another story to tell when the matchings are done. But uh, all of us, including the Election Commission of India, for example, believe that an efficient election is nothing but transparency and disclosures and disclosures. Uh, so the voter has the right to know. And that's uh, my approach to the whole uh, matter that is on the table today. And uh, so far as the solutions are concerned, I think it is enforcement, which is uh, a tight ceiling, and an enforcement which is worthwhile. Some expenditure control measures are going on. You just mentioned that how the expenditure is increasing. But I think we are, we are far behind in the game in terms of expenditure control and expenditure monitoring and expenditure capturing. So whether the money that comes from a company, whether it is going to the campaign or to the political party's own development, that's another thing. It's a matter of audit and accounts. Do we have proper scrutiny systems existing? Do we have proper expenditure control measures to capture it? I think those are the key areas to uh, look at. Uh, but another thing, if you give me... Uh, Mr. Roth, one quick time. question yeah. that I'd like to get in yeah. from uh, yeah. General Verma. General Verma, did you notice that has every political party taken out money only ahead of elections? Or has this also been taken out uh, during periods when there was no election? We haven't done that sort of an analysis as yet because the data has uh, been released yesterday evening only. So we are still in the process of doing the analysis. But one thing is very clear 
that the amount of donations via electoral bonds were the maximum just before the elections. Before the because the windows used to be opened before the elections, and in this case also the highest amount has been donated in April 2019, just before the last general elections. Interesting. 12, uh, let's move ahead now, uh, Mr. Ghosh. Let me come to you. Right, Mr. Ghosh, let me come to you and let me play the devil's advocate here. One of the arguments that were raised in the course of the hearing was that these donations were made uh, under the cover, under the veil uh, of anonymity. Uh, is that a grudge? Uh, is that a legitimate grudge that some of these companies may have? That, look, we donated the money never knowing that this information will become public. Absolutely. That can be a legitimate uh, ground uh, a company may have. But let's also be very clear as to the startling information that has come out since the, the disclosure. You have people who've done the mapping of certain companies who were facing the scanner of the EDI, income tax, uh, CBI, etc. And then within days of the raid, etc., you had these purchases of bonds happening. And you can only guess as to where these bonds have gone, including in cases where, as you see, that meg infrastructure or whatever, where this contract comes to them, a massive infrastructure contract comes to them, and they give around 966 crores as... Uh, as electoral bonds or the purchase. Of course, we don't know where they went, where those bonds went, but you know, it is uh, your guess is as good as mine. But the point that is being made is if at all there is a credible case made out that agencies of the government were being used as instruments of collecting funds for a political party, then this actually changes the whole character of the disclosure. And it calls for an effective, non-partisan and independent investigation into this. So therefore, I would think that time has come now because we have now crossed over to another stage. Now it's no longer the stage of disclosure. I think now the Supreme Court should consider actually setting up a, 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 a monitoring committee or, or a kind of a monitored investigation under its AGs uh, into uh, whether this has happened, whether the Electoral bonds has been used as a means whereby the agencies of the government have been used to, to get certain corporate entities to make donations through the, through the means of an electoral fund. So this is a very, very serious issue. And this really is, I would say, the greatest threat to the independence of, uh, of the Indian electoral process that we face. Uh, this is really, really a scam of gargantuan proportions and which really requires redress. And as I All right, Sanjay and Ghosh, we are going to come back uh, in just a bit. This is an interesting discussion. We'll be right back with you. We have to take a break here on CNBC TV 18. We'll be back with a lot more analysis uh, when we return.
the ECI to publish it by, uh, by the 15th. Now, again, today the matter was again listed before the court because the ECI this time has moved an application saying it will require some time to do the bond correlation, etc. So here the Supreme Court, as I said, already has given its judgment. The judgment has given, has, has directed the transparency disclosure. At best, at best, now a lot of information already is in the public domain. People are making and joining the dots. At best, what you'll have is that some more time will be given to the ECI to complete this exercise. But uh, Parish, what I was saying is no. that we have to see beyond this and see the elephant in the room. Now, now the information that has come out, come out in the public domain shows that there is a very, very serious case made out of the misuse of, of statutory investigating agencies. Now, this is a completely different issue altogether. Whether the Supreme Court would like to take it up in this particular case itself, or whether parties will have to move the Supreme Court separately, or the Supreme Court will start a new proceedings whatsoever, I don't know whether they even want to do so or not. But this is interesting, and we'll sure. see it in the coming weeks, how it plays out. That's a very valuable point, Mr. Ghosh. Thank you so much for that. Is there a need for an SIT now, a court-appointed SIT, to look into these uh, political donations? Uh, running out of time, uh, Major General, let me come to you for the final question. What impact do you see on the upcoming general elections, courtesy of the electoral bonds being shown the door? Some have expressed a fear that with going back to the older regime, we may have thrown the baby out with the bathwater. What is the impact on the Lok Sabha elections, on the funding for the elections? See, uh, as far as the electoral bond money goes, uh, that money is already there with the political parties. They may have used it already. And how much of it they are going to, uh, you know, use it for the elections or for whatever purpose they have used, we don't know. Uh, but the immediate thing I would say is that, uh, you know, since uh, the large denomination notes are no longer there, uh, cash and black money would certainly be used, but uh, hopefully it would be to a lesser extent uh, because uh, as uh, the political parties were thinking that, you know, the money will keep pouring in through the electoral bonds. Now that route has been closed. So I fully endorse the views which Mr. Rauth had given, you know, regarding transparency and disclosure and limiting the expenditure of the uh, political parties. And we need to uh, look at some better methods and uh, devise some ways to have, I mean, we can't just have corporates funding the uh, political parties all the time, you know. We have to come up with some better yeah. solutions and that even the Supreme Court had said. All right. Uh, we've completely run our time, but thank you very much, uh, Major General Verma, uh, Akshay Raut, and also Sanjay Ghosh for joining us. Let's see what happens in the Supreme Court. But clearly, Ashmit, uh, one thing which many activists are welcome, welcoming is the fact that now this information is available in public domain and at least a voter can be more informed while exercising his choice. With that, it's a wrap on this special show. Thank you for watching. Goodbye.